I'm sorry, Stefano. Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. Is there anybody? <laughs> yeah. Let's start. Okay. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, uh, good evening. Uh, welcome you to this World Viva and Delta System Source to Sync webinar series. Today, uh, we invite uh, Dr. and Professor Stefano Petrano from University of uh, Nicosia, uh, Nicosia from Cyprus, come here mm -hmm. to talk about uh, the cloniform. And uh, if you are in a sequence stratigraphy field, um, I guess you must have already known uh, Dr. Petrano uh, published uh, some wonderful review paper uh, starting from 2015 about the cloud form. So I met him uh, three or four years ago in London, 2017, I, I can't remember exactly, in London. And also later on, we have a meeting together in Vienna, the EGU. So uh, he has done a fantastic uh, job for help us understanding the uh, cloud form. Uh, what's a second stratigraphy structure, distribution, the relationship with sea level. So. Uh, before I introduce uh, Stefano, I will see the next uh, future talks. This Friday, we don't have a talk because this is the summer break. Since uh, this week in June, we only have Wednesday talks. So only Wednesday we have talks, no Friday talks. And uh, so as you can see, next, uh, next week, um, we have another great talk uh, about Mega Delta. So particularly under the climatic and anthropogenic stress, you know, then followed on. We have Yukon talk and the Mississippi River talk. So uh, once again, all the previous talk now is already online, archived on our YouTube channel. What you need to do just, as, you know, go to that, our YouTube channel, source to sync, tinyurl.com, S2S talks. Just to click that subscribe. I just, I sound like a YouTuber. So, and also you, you also can do is, uh, uh, or you can, if you want to receive our uh, weekly notice about the future talks, you also can following our Twitter account, source to sync it's very simple. So on Twitter, okay. Okay, Professor Stefano now at the University of uh, Nicosia, uh, Nicosia, Surplus and, uh, so as you can see, uh, he got his PhD from uh, uh, College of London, Imperial College of London, and the dissertation is working on the Sebaqueous Delta system. So also master degree from University of College uh, London and uh, originally from uh, Italy. So uh, his research, uh, I think already uh, you, uh, told you, his, is focused on quantitatively defined interpretation, uh, you know, that kind of stratigraphy, Sebacus Delta. So, uh, okay, uh, Stefano, now uh, I'll give you the field to you. Now you can share your screen for the presentation mode. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. And uh, thank you very much for uh, those who came. And um, I prepared some slides here. Um, and I think uh, it's going to be more of a chart than anything else, uh, focusing around my uh, research on clinoforms to date. Uh, the, the big big bulk of it is uh, from my PhD work, um, which as Paul said, I, I finished in 2013 from uh, Imperial College. And then there is uh, additional work which we did um, uh, when we edited uh, the special issue Bayesian research um, on clinoforms, which came out last year. And, uh, and, and an additional paper on earth science review in 2018 with Professor Elan Dansen from Bergen. So um, this talk or this chat is divided into two parts. So the first part is uh, talking about quanti quantitative identification of clinoform types, which is one of the things that I, um, try to develop on the basis of, um, uh, you know, uh, a certain amount of uh, statistical data extracted from 
pu published examples uh, in, in, my, in my PhD. Uh, the second part dealing with the concepts of compound and hybrid uh, clinoform. So let's begin with the first part without much other uh, weight. So quantity identification of clinoform types. So I'm sure you all know this, but um, perhaps it's worth repeating. Um, what is a clinoform according also to my personal interpretation, right? So uh, I, I, one of my favorite uh, definition would be that the clinoform is a frozen paleobatimetric profile, which would contain uh, typically depos uh, the depositional breaks in slope. These depositional breaks in slopes, they are called rollover points. In the most typical clinoform, which we'll see, is, which is a sigmoidal clinoform, you'd, you'd be able to identify two different um, rollover points, an upper and the lower one. In some, in some other clinoforms, you'll be able to identify only one rollover point. In some other clinoforms yet, still, um, you, you'd be able to identify no rollover points. So it's, it's perfectly planar. It's like a, it's like a slide. And uh, you know, which is uh, the exception to this uh, to this wonderful definition. Um, but uh, most clinoforms, uh, well, all clinoforms are inclined. That's that's that that's, that is uh, uh, inclined surface. That is uh, a key part of the definition. They are inclined, and normally they are diastemic horizons. So diastemic it means they are associated with sediment con condensation and or um, hiatus of some sort. Um, now that, that 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 is something worth thinking about. Why I think we think that uh, this is a, a significant part of the definition because the progradation of uh, any system is a continuous process, right? So how it is that we only from this continuous process we see a number of surfaces. We don't see an infinite uh, amount of surfaces, but just a certain number of surfaces. What why in other words, why would we shoot photographs, frames, only at that time? We see all that time and not that time plus 100 years, for example. Uh, well, that's because um, when we're working with seismic data, most clinoforms that come from seismic data, right? There are some from outcrops, but mostly seismic data. You need to have some, some sort of um, lithological contrast in order to image anything. Uh, there needs to be a contrast in acoustic impedance, right, between a body above and the body below. So, <clears throat> yeah, so in order to create that contrast in acoustic impedance, I have a slide dedicated to that, that usually necessitates, for example, condensation and the formation of, uh, for example, limestone uh, or carbonate cemented horizon at that particular time due to condensation or uh, flooding surface and flooding surface are for a draping of the particular uh, paleobatomic profile with muddy, um, more distal sediments. Okay, so that's why the, the concept of uh, diastemic surface is quite uh, important. Then we'll see that clinoforms are developed over a huge different ranges of scales, both temporal and spatial. That is quite important and a lot of you people, uh, you will know because you are working with it, but uh, people that approach clinoform for the first time, they, they make a lot of confusion in terms of uh, what is a shelf, what is uh, a delta. They tend, to, they tend to call everything delta, right? So, uh, but we will see that that's not always the case. Um, and why do they grow? That's another, another important uh, concept. So. For example, if you're dealing with the shoreline, shoreline is one of the classical cases we will see, we'll see more systematically after this, the first slide, where uh, clinoforms, accretionary clinoforms are growing. And uh, this, uh, they grow in the case of the shoreline, in most cases associated to a river input point, a river mouth, which brings a lot of sediments. These sediments are being debauched and um, due to the current uh, deceleration at the river mouth and there is a lot of uh, sediment accumulation ratio um, and as a consequence you start to accrete uh, the clinoform bodies in subaqueous settings because we'll see that there are lots of clinoforms that are actually fully subaqueous instead there is a sediment that is being brought in by currents by marine currents of different types and uh, 
the, se um, the, the sediment it is deposited in that particular place due to the changeover from highly energetic settings above uh, um, fair weather wave base, for example, to less energetic settings under that depth. So usually the top set in uh, sub area uh, in Sabekio setting represents this transition from water that are continuously uh, moved by by waves and by currents and waters that are instead much more, much less uh, much less energetic. Okay, this is as as a low order uh, introduction to Kronoform. So let's go back again to the concept of uh, diastemic and why do we see certain Kronoforms and we don't see other Kronoforms. So this slide over here shows the concept that lots of people know uh, the difference between little stratigraphic correlation between two wells. In two wells, here we see one sand, another sand, third sand. Also here we see three sands. You correlate sand with sand in most cases. Uh, and chronostratigraphic correlation. If you, think, if you are in a place where chronoforms are developed or are supposed to be developing, like deltas, all the deltas, even if you don't see them in seismic, you can actually start to correlate these packages in the gamma rays uh, using an inclined um, pattern. So you don't correlate sand with sand, but you correlate the sand with, which is more proximal, there's more proximal phases with the more distal phases uh, in a more distal position. Now, in this particular sketch, you'll see that each of these individual chronophones that have been drawn in the sketch, the sketch they are associated with the flooding surface. It's a flooding event. Each, each chronoform is a flooding event. So uh, here we have mouth bar sandstones. And on top of the mouth bar sandstone, we have shale, you know, like uh, offshore shales. So this is this draping of the offshore shale on top of the mouth bar sandstone is what creates the contrast in acoustic impedance, which makes it, in this particular example, visible in seismic. Okay. Other example, you would, you, you would not have that perhaps, but you'd have uh, some dra draping of um, uh, cement. Cement that will create the contrast in acoustic impedance, which is sufficient to image that particular body and not the next body. Why are chronoforms important? Chronoforms underpin all our understanding of sequence stratigraphy. Since from uh, the, the first formulations of sequence stratigraphy from Exxon in the 1970s to the present day. And here there is a seminal paper, Alan Hansen and Martinson 96, where they came up with the concept of uh, shoreline trajectory analysis. What is shoreline trajectory analysis? Essentially, you pinpoint where the, roll the upper rollover, as I call it, the upper rollover is present in each chronoform and you connect them together. And this is a the upper or lower represent the shoreline according to this uh, idea. And as a consequence, by connecting subsequent shoreline points, you understand how the sea level was changing through time. So that was a great concept that you uh, using something that you see in seismic, in most cases, you can uh, understand the relative variations of sea level through, through the time. And you can see that, for example, the shoreline trajectory can go, can, can, can go uh, basinward and upward. And this is what we term normal regression in, in uh, sequence stratigraphic talk. It can go basinward and downward. And this is what we call uh, forced regression when sea level falls from uh, uh, time one to time two. Or uh, the, uh, the, the shoreline trajectory can go downward towards the hinterland and upward. And that's what we call a transgression, an accretionary transgression. There are certain cases where uh, the sea level changes, but there is no deposition. And that's what uh, in this paper they call the non accretionary uh, regression or transgression. So, very useful. And in some of the most uh, uh, up to date um, um, formulation of the concept of sequence stratigraphy, they utilize, the authors utilize the concept of shoreline trajectory analysis extensively to define what the different, uh, what the different um, system tracks look, li look like, right? So, um, yeah, so that's, that, that's quite useful. But an important thing is that not every clinic form is at the shoreline. So therefore, uh, what lots of people tend to do as soon as they see a client, of particular in the industry, 
not so much in research, but for sure in the industry, as soon as they see reclinal forms, they think, first of all, it's a reservoir. And secondly, that it's a shoreline. And neither of these two assumptions are, are correct, of course. And that leads me directly to um, our first um, important point, the four major types of clinoforms or the four major scales of clinoforms, same thing. So um, looking at present day clinoforms and ancient clinoforms, we can differentiate immediately um, three different scales of clinoforms uh, that are situated in different geodynamic contexts uh, and uh, they are responding to different uh, spatial temporal scale morphology and also different outbuilding uh, dynamics. What are these scales? So first of all, delta scale clinoforms. Delta scale clinoforms are situated either at the shoreline or in the shelf, mid shelf somewhere. And they are def defined as tens of meters height, for set height. Um, then there is the shelf edge clinoforms. Now, shelf edge clinoforms in this, in, this, uh, in, in this interpretation, in this um, definition, is, interpret is defined as hundreds of meters of vertical relief. And um, it may be associated with the uh, dynamic transition between continental crust and oceanic crust, or it may not. It may not. It may be somewhere within the shelf, uh, within the continental shelf, and will separate an area which we call shelf sensu stricto, and the other area which will be uh, a, a submarine plateau, a deeper submarine plateau, which can, according to your uh, point of view, this is a matter of point of view, you can call it basin. If people think, uh, look at these kind of forms, you say, you know, the, the, the bottoms that here are in a, in, a, in a basin, right? But of course, if you zoom out, it could be that after a while, there will be another major, um, another major uh, clinoform, which is developed at the actual uh, COB, at the actual continent oceanic uh, transition, which we call, um, uh, um, which we call continental margin clinoforms, and they are characterized by heights that are thousands of meters. Now, these are definitions which are um, morphology related. So therefore, it could be, as I said, that there are clinoforms that are hundreds of meters that are at the COB. OK. Still, we call them shelf edge. Or there, are, there can be clinoforms that are thousands of meters that are not at the COB. Still, we call them continental margin um, scale. They are matters of scale. OK. In most cases, in order to create a difference of level of thousands of meters, you need to be somewhere close to the COB, but not necessarily. OK, so there are th these three different types of clinoforms from the standpoint of size, how big they are. The delta scale clinoforms, in terms, they can be divided. I already introduced that, but I repeat it. Uh, so they are both tens of meters in height, but there can be some delta scale clinoforms whose upper and lower point corresponds perfectly with the shoreline. And that we call it shoreline clinoforms or subaerial delta clinoforms. And the other one where the upper and lower point is situated at a certain depth, fully, sub fully subaqueous. And this depth, we will see changes depending on where you are. It can be uh, 10 meter, not very common, 20 meter becomes more common, 30, 40, 50 meters. We're talking about that kind of depth uh, below, the, the, below the sea level. Shelf edge clinoform is also fully subaqueous. Uh, it's got the clinoform rollover, which is fully subaqueous, unless, unless we're talking about shelf edge delta. Shelf edge delta happens when the delta clinoforms manage to prograde throughout all this shelf and reach the shelf edge. And so therefore, we have different kind of forms that are merging together. So therefore, that's going to be the only case when you're going to have um, a, a river mouth, which is uh, situated on the shelf edge or very close to the shelf edge. And as a consequence, the shoreline rollover merging with the shelf edge rollover, shelf edge delta. This is an occurrence. Uh, quite common. Why is it so common? Because we will see uh, the speed of progradation of these clinoform bodies is very different. The small guys 
particularly the shoreline planoforms, are very fast. They can progress extremely fast um, uh, during uh, each single regressive transgressive cycles. That's because that's that's obvious why because there is less accommodation space there and there is more sediment input. You are close to the river mouth and there isn't a lot of uh, water there. So therefore, these clinoforms are like the these small clinoforms are like the little miles, right? So the little miles they can run very very fast and reach this point, and then they can go and run backward during backstepping uh, phases, and then can run uh, forward again. And the, and this is really what dictates the independent regressive transgressive cycles which we see. On the opposite uh, side, the shelf edge clinoforms are normally slow. They are the elephants. They are the elephants, they cannot usually only progress forward, they cannot backstep unless uh, in very specific cases. And they can only progress forward slowly because you are far away from the sediment input point, except when the delta will merge with them, when, which is the phase of shelf edge delta. During that phase, they everything can progress much faster than usual because you are close now to the sediment input point. Um, and of course, this whole dynamic um, proceeds, and uh, the shelf edge delta will, uh, and the shelf edge clinoform will uh, eventually merge with the continental margin clinoform. So, these are the type of um, the type of uh, cycles which, which in the in the in the um, paper with the land answer we term the uh, cycle from compound clinoform system where we have independent. Uh, clinoforms, independent rollover points, which can be pinpointed at the same time along uh, the positional profile from the shoreline to the abyssal plane and prograding at the same time, uh, although with, with very different uh, rates of progradation. Um, and this is what we call compound system. So in this image shows a compound system with four different systems of clinoform, shoreline clinoform, so Baker's Delta Clinoform, Shelf Edge Clinoforms, Continental Margin Clinoforms, they're all progressing at the same time. They are separate uh, rollover points located um, at, in different locations, and they're all progressing at very different rates. The shoreline guys are progressing much faster than anything else. And then when they eventually merge together, that's what we call the hybrid Clinoform. So the whole cycle is a cycle of or progressive uh, merging together of clinoforms and detachment again during transgression. And then during the next regression, they will eventually merge again together. We will see this concept better uh, in the course of the presentation. So let's look again at uh, some example of these different scales of clinoforms. So delta scale clinoforms that are tens of meters in height, example here from an outcrop. Example, shoreline clinoforms from uh, an ancient uh, formation, Cretaceous in uh, Utah. Um, ten, as you can see, this is the vertical bar, 20 meters. Uh, example, subaqueous delta, Holocene Ganges. This is a scale bar, 20 meters. Example, <clears throat> this is uh, Samprone uh, delta scale subaqueous clinoforms of southern Spain, also with the, with a comparable uh, height. Then we have the shelf edge scale clinoforms that is go with heights of hundreds of meters. You can see the, the scale bar there. And this is an example um, uh, from seismic. And this is an example from the New Jersey shelf, which is very well known thanks to some seminal publications, particularly by Professor Steckler. Then we have the biggest of them all, which are clinoforms that are associated with the, with the, with the COB, with the continent ocean boundaries, uh, thousands of meters of height. You can see here the bar two kilometers, here bar one kilometer. This is from Southwest Africa. You can see here the SDRs, uh, the seaward dipping reflections that all mark the transition from continental crust <clears throat> to oceanic basement. Okay. Another concept <clears throat> that uh, I wanted to introduce is the, is the differentiation between active and passive uh, clinoforms. Most people, they would traditionally call clinoform only active clinoforms. Um, and by active clinoforms, we, we, we call essentially bodies that are actively growing, actively prograding. For example, the blue body over here is an active clinoform. 
for example, the green body over here is an active chromosome. However, descending from the uh, definition of chromosomes which I introduced previously, there is that also bodies like the yellow one over here, it should, it should be termed a chromosome because it's a, a paleo, uh, paleo uh, bathymetric profile with associated uh, breaks in slope. So it responds to the, to the, to the generic um, definition. But the difference, of course, is one, it embodies the accretion, the, 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 the direct accretion of a sedimentary system, for example, the blue body over here, whereas the yellow blood body represents the passive plastering <coughs> um, of, of usually marine finds on top of, um, on top of a, a pre-existing slope, okay? So generally speaking, accretionary clinoforms uh, or active clinoforms are directly associated with uh, uh, sediment input points or currents that are directly feed them and directly, uh, directly push them to progress quite fast. Whereas passive clinoforms, they're mostly associated with settling from suspension in a distal setting, which are basically plastering on top of an existing slope. Uh, this um, in this other sketch here, um, this would be an, an active chromosome, and this would be a passive one, which is basically just plastering passively on top of an pre-existing uh, slope. If from this other sketch you can see a number of uh, examples of uh, places where you tend to find passive chromosomes that drape on tectonically generated structures, you can find them here. Chromosome drapes on intrabasinal heights and ridges. Um, you can find them here inside the canyon walls, so on and so forth. Of course, delta clinoforms, if they are directly associated with sediment input points, they are mostly active. But there are phases where they become passive, as we saw in the previous example. This is from the Po Delta in Italy. There is a phase of active progradation in blue, and then a phase of plastering passive in this location. If you move uh, a, long a long strike in another location at the time where this is being plastered here, passive, passive deposition, it will turn into active progradation. So it's an extremely dynamic uh, setting, of course. So then if we go back to uh, the definition, um, the fact that there exist these four different scales of clinoforms, which is embodied by this sketch, and the fact that they exist uh, the uh, fine, fine grained, uh, well, there exist the passive types and there exist the accretionary types. And then the, uh, the um, passive types are all, always fine grained. And the accretionary ones, it depends on the type of sediment input. They can be fine grained or they can be coarse grained. Okay. You can intersect each of these four categories. <clears throat> so that, uh, so uh, shoreline. Uh, delta scale subacus, uh, shelf edge, and continental uh, margin clinoforms. Each of these four types, you intersect them with, uh, um, with the three main, the, the three main uh, type of um, dynamic of growth. So therefore, uh, passive, which are fine grained always, ac uh, active, uh, coarse grained, or active, fine grained, three possible types. And, uh, and so therefore, you get 12 different types of uh, classes of clinoforms, which is exactly what we did, did here. Main type divided into accretionary or draping. Accretionary being active, draping being passive. Accretionary then is divided into coarse grained or fine grained. Draping can only be fine grained. And then there are the final codes, 12 classes, and there are examples. So for example, this will be an example of an accretionary coarse grained. This would be an, ex an example of, uh, of delta, delta scale. Uh, this is an example of shoreline uh, accretionally fine grained, so on and so forth. And <clears throat> really, uh, this was uh, the uh, classification of carnivores, which we proposed in the paper with the Lanansen in 2018, which really encapsulates uh, m m a, lot of, um, a lot of the possible um, characteristics, both in terms of, of scale, morphology, <clears throat> but also um, constituent, uh, constituent sediment grain, grain uh, size together within these classes. Of course, nothing is perfect. Everything can be 
improved, but it's, uh, it, it was a, a, a good attempt to come up with the, with the primary subdivision of coniforms in uh, meaningful classes. Now, going into the quantitative classification of chloroform, first of all, let's define uh, some terms, some, some terminology. So, so that everyone is working on the same, with the same terms. So rollover points, again, breaks in slope, upper rollover point, lower rollover point in a classical sigmoidal chloroform. The area between the two, two rollover points is called uh, forset. The area uh, seaward of the lower rollover point is called bottom set. The, sea, the area upward of the upper rollover point is called top set. And of course, so each of these areas can, uh, you can measure the height, forset height, heat, for example, and the down deep extent, forset down deep extent in this case. Inflection zone. Inflection zone is essentially the steepest part of the forset, okay? So that represents really the, the steepest part of each uh, chloroform. Um, then profiles. Profiles, as I said before, can be planar, where you don't identify any breaks in slope. It can, it can be asymmetrical, also known as oblique, <clears throat> concave upward uh, profile. And finally, it can be symmetrical or sigmoidal, where you identify two rollover points, one at the bottom, one at the top. Okay, <clears throat> I can see you from the. Um, I I have questions here. Should I answer at the end uh, the questions? I think I'll. Uh, yeah, let me answer it at the end. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so then. What we did, we looked at the number of published uh, examples um, uh, and, and came up with a statistical data set globe of, of, of chloroforms. <clears throat> I would say we can add much more examples. You know, if I had time and I had the budget, <laughs> that's what I would do. I would add more and more in order to make this statistical data set as robust as it gets. These are preliminary results. <clears throat> and uh, as you can see, we can uh, come up with specific distributions <clears throat> of the quantitative ranges for each of these parameters. Total relief, four set, inter bottom set, other, to uh, other top set height, then down deep extent, ex extent of each of these settings. And as you can see, each types of chloroforms can does show uh, a rather independent range. Of course, in certain cases, they are overlapping, but not always. For example, if one takes the force at height, there, is, there seems to be a clear break in ranges between uh, the force at height of continental margin chloroforms, which are definitely very high, the force at height of shelf edge chloroforms, which are intermediate, and then of all the delta scale uh, families, delta scale, muddy subacus, sandy subacus, muddy shoreline, and sandy uh, shoreline. Then uh, other interesting aspect which we can look, um, which, which we can get looking at these um, distributions. <clears throat> this is the down deep extent of four set, bottom set, and top set, as well as the total chloroform. And you can see that the Sampron subacus uh, chloroform shows the narrowest down deep extent of each single part of each chloroform compared to uh, other chloroform uh, classes, interestingly. The heights is quite comparable, the chloroform height, as you can see, uh, with all the other delta scale uh, classes. But the down deep extent is much narrower for the Semprone uh, subacus class, which therefore results into steeper. Uh, which we see now here, gradient. So gradient shows the steepness. And you can see immediately the sampron sub subacus chloroforms are characterized by anomalously steep profiles compared to the other ones, even when you compare it with Sandy, because of course, the coarse grain size uh, has got a steeper, um, um, a st a steeper uh, uh, repose profile. Okay, so um, if you have a coarse grain sediment, you tend to you you tend to have a um, steeper slope. You want to form steeper slope. But if you compare seemingly 
based on this data, if you compare Sempron subaqueous chloroform and Sempron shoreline chloroforms, it looks they are much steeper the subaqueous ones. <clears throat> then what else can we see over here? The shape ratio. So the shape ratio is the ratio which differentiates between oblique and sigmoidal chloroforms. You can see that most subaqueous chloroform, both muddy and sandy, are tend to be more sigmoidal. Some are a little bit oblique, but mostly we are towards the sigmoidal end of chloroforms. Whereas, <clears throat> undoubtedly, when you look at the shoreline ones, both muddy and sandy, interestingly, uh, they tend to be much more uh, oblique. That's, of course, because the upper, the upper lower point in that case correspond to the um, shoreline, which is such an abrupt break uh, of the profile. So obviously it tends to be more, more oblique. Um, time scale. <clears throat> when you look at climate, for sometimes you, you want to ask yourself, well, how, how much time am I seeing in my seismic? How much geological time? And <clears throat> of, of course, the answer to that is very much depending. So if you're looking at continental margin, you are looking at millions of years. <clears throat> each each um, chronotheme, each uh, interval bounded by chronoforms, yeah, it, it tends to represent mil millions of years. Uh, if you're looking at the shelf edge chronoforms, that can go from millions of years to tens of thousands of years. Um, whereas if you're looking at the small guys, we are talking time that ranges from hundreds of years particularly if you are working with recent ones, it can be hundreds of years. Sometimes it can be tens of years. Uh, there are some papers that show tens of years uh, to thousands, uh, ten, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. So <clears throat> clearly we are seeing a different amount of time, very different amount of time, depending on the scale. <clears throat> also, the trajectory, we, we talked about the concept of shoreline trajectory, but of course the concept of shoreline trajectory can be applied, uh, strictly speaking, only to these two guys, the shoreline chloroforms, muddy and sandy. Because if you're trying to uh, apply that to, for example, the subaqueous delta chloroforms, your upper or lower point does not represent the, the, the shoreline. So its trajectory uh, will depict something different from uh, the, you know, the ranges of relative sea level uh, changes. Um, and in fact, as you can see, when you look at the bigger scale chloroforms, sorry, if you look at the bigger scale chloroforms like shelf edge and continental, they tend to be a higher angle, naturally higher angle. And one reason uh, to explain that is that they represent longer term cycles of basin fill, which are dominated by the subsidence, particularly thermal subsidence, because they tend to be closer to the, to the uh, continent ocean boundaries. Uh, whereas the small guys over here, they are very much dominated by the regression and transgression cycles. They are very much dominated by the input and not so much by the availability of uh, uh, accommodation. So that's why on short term, the, 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 the delta scale chloroforms, they are dominated by low angle trajectories, seemingly. Whereas the bigger the chloroforms, the higher the trajectory angle, the natural trajectory angle seems to, um, seems to be. Uh, also here, uh, we have uh, highlighted the progradation rates. I already introduced that qualitatively before. The fact that the small one are like mice. They, they run very, very fast throughout your shelf and then go back very, very fast. And then they go forward again a number of times <clears throat> continuously, whereas your shelf edge and your continental margin, they're like elephants. They slowly, slowly want to go forward, but uh, they take a long amount of time to do that. And you can see that uh, over here, this crown from production rate in kilometers per millions of years. Um, here, of course, it's logarithmic scale. And there is several orders of magnitude be between the progression rate of the big scale chloroforms and the progression rates of uh, the delta scale chloroforms, particularly the muddy subaqueous deltas, because the muddy subaqueous delta are very fast, because most muddy subaqueous deltas they're associated to the present day large rivers of the world, the Yangtze, uh, the Ganges, the Amazon. You know that's where most publication on the on the uh, muddy subaqueous delta come from, and there is a huge amount of sediment input um, associated to those systems. And of course, shoreline chloroforms. Shoreline chloroforms being uh, muddy or sandy, it doesn't matter. They are both associated to a lot of sediment input and not so much accommodation uh, availability. And as a consequence, 
the system progresses fast in, in, in both cases. <clears throat> okay, so another thing to consider is that if you plot these parameters that we've uh, measured, so high standing extent for four set uh, bottom set and top set, shape ratio to differentiate between uh, sigmoidal and oblique, uh, age scale, <clears throat> the vertical accumulation rate, the progradation rate, so on and so forth. If you plot them against each other, is there any trend? Is there any uh, correlation <clears throat> between uh, each couple of parameters? You may expect uh, yes, you might expect not. The answer it is on the basis of uh, the data set that we've looked at is that there is um, quite a lot of uh, correlations. Uh, here in these cells, you can see the, the, the gray scales represents weak to strong positive correlations with a, uh, an R square greater than 0 0.1. The dark one, um, uh, yeah, uh, the dark one without numbers represent weak to strong negative correlation. Uh, again, R square between uh, greater than zero point one. Um, the gray one with number and the and the black one with numbers represent strong, moderate to strong, uh, positive and negative correlations with an R square greater than zero point five. For example, <clears throat> some interesting correlations. Uh, between the water depths of the rollover point and, for example, the craniform height, the total craniform height here, or the four-set height, um, or uh, between the height of the craniforms and the age of the craniform. We saw it before. The, the you know the bigger the craniform, the longer uh, amount of time it represents. And this is true also uh, from the quantitative standpoint, very much. This one is interesting because basically you, you now can estimate the depth of um, a rollover point based on some morphological uh, um, parameters that you can measure. For example, the force set height. Uh, of course, it's not going to be perfect, but it's just an, an additional proxy that you can throw in on top of your uh, forums biophages, for example. And you can see here uh, the correlation between uh, all these parameters. You can see in, in most cases, there can be a rather tight uh, correlation between each of these uh, parameter couples, of course, with a spread, with an error, uh, all, all that you want. And this, I find it fascinating, right? Because in certain cases, some of these parameters, they don't want, they, they, you know, they, they, they shouldn't depend on each other, but somehow they do. You know, I don't know, uh, I, I, cannot I can tell you, Philosophically, perhaps when you think why they correlate with each other, but you know it's still it's still a, a, an expanding field of um, active knowledge at the moment. This is data driven. We're just looking at the data, you know, <clears throat> and uh, and this is what it shows us. Okay, let's see an example of application <clears throat> of this quantitative characterization. So now we have all these parameters that have been characterized quantitatively with the spread. Of, um, of, of, of values, can we use them, for example, to interpret other craniforms that are not part of the data set? And this is what we tried to do with this latest publication last year on Bayesian research. This was a publication on, on the North Sea, uh, looking at the Eridanos system. The Eridanos system, for those, those of you who do not know the North Sea, is a recent, uh, they call it Delta. In reality, is a shelf edge scale, uh, kind of them very much associated to a sediment input point because it, it, it is associated with very high uh, speed of progradation. So generally speaking, we can call it a shelf edge delta. And this sediment input point was coming from Fenoscandia. So it was coming from Denmark and Norway, okay, into the uh, Central North Sea, that's the Central North Sea and Southern North Sea. And essentially, um, this system managed to prograde the entirety of the North Sea Basin, which, uh, you know, it's um, several hundreds of kilometers. Um, let's say from uh, particularly from the Miocene uh, to uh, the early Pleistocene. We start and, and forming these big craniforms, as you can see uh, um, at the scale of uh, shelf edge. Uh, Oligocene, uh, Lower Miocene, Upper Miocene, Gelasian, and Lower um, uh, Quaternary. We are looking in particular at the last phase of this progradation. So therefore, when the climate then managed to encroach 
onto the, onto the uh, western flank of the North Sea Rift system, the British flank, the Minor Sea High, which is this region over here, which is a platform. So basically, the Klanhofer managed to progress all of the central graben over here, which is a big uh, hole, okay? And finally, they started to climb onto the opposite flank of the North Sea, which, you know, it's, it's something fascinating. When people look only at this play, place over here, they, they think, oh, this is an all-up relationship. It's not an all-up relationship. It's a, bot uh, it, it, it's, it, it's a bottom set of clanophones, <clears throat> which are being basically, um, which are basically downlapping onto the flank of the, of the of the system and are trying to climb. But that's what we call climbing clanophones. And this is what they look like in uh, in um, uh, seismic cross section. So very much delta scale, uh, sorry, shelf edge scale clanophones prograding, sigmoidal profiles, and trying to climb onto the opposite side. From the opposite side, there are small clanophones, uh, delta scale clanophones that are being prograding towards the opposite side, being fed from the UK, the UK in Interland over here, and being fed towards the other side. Uh, so uh, you can see very different scales. You can see very different uh, gradients, uh, morphological gradients of the of the clinoforms. and also here you can see a compound system, a direct association between delta scale clinoforms here and shelf edge clinoform down. And here you cannot see that. So basically, in this uh, clinotem over here, the two profiles have been merged. So basically, we identify five different clinothems, clinothem bodies over here. The first one is being A1, which is this delta scale one. Um, then A2, which is this shelf edge one. Then A3, which is when the two, this, this brown body, you can only identify one rollover point. So basically, ideally, the um, shoreline and 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 the and the, and, the, and, and the shelf edge clamor they are merged together in that setting. And then we have Clanothem B, which is the, the, the yellow body, which is being fed from the UK prograding uh, basinwards. So this is a normal direction of progression basinward. But as you can see, that it didn't manage to go far, right? It's just, just a little, little body compared to this uh, giant here. <clears throat> and C, which is a smaller one. So, And then we measure the, 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 the morphological characters and plot them together. So that's, that's um, a zoom onto Clanothem B. Uh, the small one that is being progressed from uh, from the UK progressing uh, base inwards. You can see lovely, lovely clinoforms, small ones, but very well imaged. Um, you can see the, the, the rollover points here. So at the beginning here, they're very much sigmoidal. Then they tend to become more, um, more oblique. And then they, they clearly show a degradational, a degradational profile. So they, they, they tend to show uh, forced regression towards the end. So that's, that's your kind of MB, uh, lovely imaging. Okay, so we measure these characters and we plot them, them in, in, into this um, uh, graph. So the first graph is showing, for example, roller, rollover water depths and paleobadimetric estimates. And we have different fields here that are deriving from our statistical data sets <clears throat> from elsewhere in the world. So this, 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 uh, this field over here would be Delta scale shoreline clanophones that got uh, rollover water depths, which is uh, quite little because it's a shoreline, so it should be zero in theory. And uh, for set height, which is um, delta scale. Then the green field, uh, which is also uh, for set height, which is delta scale, tens of meters. But rollover water depth is much deeper, right? <clears throat> Then there is this other field, the black one, which is shelf edge and continental margin clinoforms, which are rollover, rollover uh, water depth much deeper, but also for set height much higher. <clears throat> and you can see we plotted here with different, um, with different um, how do you go, rectangles. The rectangles represent the, the four clinoforms that we want to find out what they are. So A1, A2, and A3, which are part of the Eridanos that comes from Norway. And then B, which is the small clanophore, which comes from the UK. <clears throat> and you, you can see A1, A1, which was this, this guy over here, the one that we said was, uh, was a delta, pretty much falling between subaqueous and, and shoreline, is definitely not in the field of um, shelf, shelf edge. 
A2 and A3 is in the field of shelf edge. <clears throat> B is somewhere in between. Yeah, there is some there is some uh, uh, confusion about B. And then we plot them the same on a different graph, a graph that plots shape shape ratio versus four set slope. And here again, you have fields of existence of the various chromosome types, and you can see in gray. They are where our various uh, kind of that we want to find out what they are, they fall. And then we use the third graph again, which is age scale versus progression rate. And again, we plot them uh, our uh, uh, four kind of that we want to find out what they are. And progressively, we are decreasing the degrees of freedom of the interpretation. So for example, for climate MA1, Using the first uh, the first plot only, uh, the the interpretation will be delta scale, uh, subaqueous or shoreline. By using the second plot, um, uh, the the solution would be a muddy delta scale subaqueous or shoreline. Using the third plot, subaqueous option is now more likely now because it's got an anomalously slow progradation. So again, we put together step by step, and finally we go from uh, some initial theory to something that is more um, uh, strong, strong at the end in terms of interpretation. For example, Crown of MB, which was the small one that comes from the UK, if you remember, uh, using, the first, uh, using the first plot, to, uh, the solution will be delta scale subaqueous uh, or shoreline. The second plot will tell you sandy delta scale subaqueous. So it tends to be a delta scale subaqueous or a shoreline. Using the first plot, which is looking at progradation rates because it is uh, slower in terms of progradation, right? It falls over here. The subaqueous option is more likely now. So at the end of this quantitative progradation, we are saying, for example, that this uh, beast over here may, rep may represent a uh, subaqueous um, delta progradation. And uh, we went to look if there were any well that were going to drill through this body. Indeed, there were two wells that drill through the, this particular bodies and they come up with sandy, for example, sand. In certain cases, it even had some traces of oil. Um, and it had uh, on the top set area um, uh, traces, uh, significant amount of shells, marine shells. So uh, it is interesting because uh, everything seems to be consistent with uh, this type of interpretation. Okay, so conclusions of the first part of the um, of the presentation. So the, the first conclusion: don't shout shoreline or sea level proxy as soon as you see a clinoform, because there are different scales of clinoforms, each one associated to something different. Continental margin scale: it's got the forset height of thousands of meters, rollover water depths between half a kilometer and two kilometers. Shelf edge scale has got hundreds of meters forset height. Water depths of the of the upper and lower point 50 to 500 meters. Delta scale subaqueous is intra shelf. It's got the force set heights of tens of meters. Water depth 50 to 60, five to sorry five to 60 meters. And finally, shoreline clinoforms. They are the only ones that are true sea level proxy and and, and and shoreline. Also, don't shout reservoir as soon as you see a seismic clinoform because there are a lot of visible clinoforms that are completely muddy. And in particular, when you look at the subaqueous one, there is a force, a force set gradient threshold of 0 0.4, 0 0.7 degrees of the force set between the muddy and the sandy systems. Then we've proposed a novel hierarchical classification scheme for clinoforms, and the sandstone prone and mudstone prone variant can be at least tentatively predicted on the basis of the morphology, as we saw, as we saw in, the, in the last application example. OK. So I'll uh, answer to some questions that I've received now before we proceed to, to the second uh, part. Uh, so Gregor Eberly, nice to meet you, uh, all, even though, uh, uh, you know, over the internet. Um, there are four different kind of system with different rollover points, different rate of progradation. Yet in your and other sequence stratigraphy models, only one kind of type is considered. Which one do you consider for sequence stratigraphy? Uh, what do you mean that uh, in my uh, sequence stratigraphy model only one kind of type is considered? Uh, well, I, I said I said already that the only um, one that is uh, a consistent sea level proxy is the shoreline uh, clinoform. So the, you you need to be 
make sure that you are able to pinpoint the location of the shoreline if you want to strictly follow sequence strategy so therefore the relative sea level changes so yeah you have to look at um, other parameters that uh, either from morphology classification like the one that we use or from faces if you have cores great uh, that will let, make you sure that what you are looking at is, is a shoreline clanifer and then you can use the, the rollover break as as um, as a, a relative sea level proxy Uh, Lucas Valor, hello Stefano. Uh, would you say the drifting planoforms are dominated by longshore drifts <clears throat> and that the ocean current processes? We, we, we are looking now at uh, the second part of this uh, about longshore drifts. Um, the drifting planoforms are not necessarily associated with longshore drifts, they're associated to uh, settling from suspension, I would say, and the dist remote location of input point, uh, I would say. Is something that is visible, but it is visibly not prograding. It's, it's both more or less aggrading, passively draping over a pre existing slope. Um, then, Gregor Eberle again. Several authors describe the large scale climate from the central grab as part of a contoured drift system. How can you dis distinguish this drift climate from, from delta sh uh, shelf climate? From? So, the drift uh, system, I will show you where they are. This, 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 is, this is the drift that also authors describe. So uh, uh, this is pretty much developing towards the end of the progradation. Here there was a trough left between uh, these um, delta shelf edge clanoforms and these other uh, delta scale clanoforms. There was kind of a seaway being left to at the end of the, the of the progradation of these two systems that were progressing against each other, there was a trough being left in there, and over there there were strong currents that were being fed, uh, also in, in connection with the uh, with the preglacial climates, and you know, and they would lead to they would lead to that. Uh, Brian Romans, I also want to thank you. <laughs> How do we think about the width of clanotem the positional bodies? Have widths been, been mapped constrained or is it too uncertain because of how they may merge with adjust? Yeah, uh, width, uh, if I understand your question, uh, is what I call uh, uh, down, down, down the positional, um, uh, how do I call it? Sorry, I don't want to tell you something. Mm. Down deep extent. So that, that's how I define the, the width. Uh, if this is what what you what you uh, are are asking. So the uh, upper rollover point, the lower rollover point, the down uh, deep extent, the horizontal distance from this two rollover point, we call it the FD, the down deep extent of the four set width of the four set. Whereas the vertical distance between upper and lower rollover point, we call it FH, which is height. Of the force, so down deep extent of the force set and height of the force set, and the same for the bottom set. So the bottom set or inner bottom set would go from the lower rollover point to the kind of from toe point. Down deep extent of the inner uh, bottom set and height of the bit, uh, inner bottom set, uh, BD and BH. Same for the top set, so on and so forth. Uh, uh, uh. So Brian said, thinking about the long strike dimension coming into and out of the slide of this figure. Okay, that's what you mean uh, in terms of width. No, I, di I didn't measure that. I didn't measure that. So uh, if you want to do that, uh, you're, you're welcome. <laughs> to do a, a paper on that. Hey, Steph, no, uh, uh, a quick question. You know, yeah. about the bottom set. This yeah. is some kind of controversial. Do you think the bottom set is the continuation of the full set or the bottom set is a totally different old stuff? Well, uh, you know, in the way how we measure, uh, uh, because we, we had to measure it morphologically somehow. So the only place of the bo bottom set that you can uh, define morphologically uh, with strict parameters is the what we call inner bottom set. So therefore, that would go from the lower rollover point to the clinoform toe point, 
which we define the chromophore top point as the point where the chromophore in the bottom set setting becomes conformable with the with the yeah. clan, you know with the surface underneath. So from these two points, we call it inner bottom set, and we can measure bottom set down deep extent, the bottom set height. This kind I of see. Thing. I see. Uh, in, in a sigmoidal clinoform, it is it is is a continuous right. It's, it's the same. It's the same body. Uh, the the only separation between the four set and the inner bottom set is the lower lower point. So yeah, uh, yeah, that 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 is uh, yeah the difference between the two. Because sometimes you know when we see the transgressive surface TS, then TST, the transgressive system tract, and so that that TST extended out. Some people was uh, maybe misinterpreted as a part of the bottom set. But actually, this is the uh, you know the layer beneath the maximum flooding surface. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, totally, totally. That's uh, and it's something worth considering. Okay, so let's move the part two. You know, I'm looking forward yeah. to your part two. Okay. All right, let's let's move on there. Uh, 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 uh. That's a fantastic talk. It's a chat. <laughs> So the part two is compound and hybrid clinoforms. So what's a compound and what is hybrid? So we, we go back to this sketch, which um, it was one of the initial publications. You know, so there is uh, the delta plane, delta slope with the shoreline in between, the shoreline point here, the first rollover point. That there is a shelf or inner shelf, if you want to call it like that, shelf edge break. And that is your uh, shelf edge clinoforms. Then there is the stable submarine plateau, and then there is the continental margin uh, clinoforms. So, as I said before at the beginning of this talk, if you see these independent uh, clinoforms that are progressing at the same time, all be at different rates together, we call it compound. Now, this term compound, a lot of people uh, in the in the original definition of this term, they only apply to deltas. So the, they say so. The, there is a compound clinoform. What they mean is that there is a shoreline clinoforms and there is a subaqueous delta clinoforms that are progressing together. Compound system. In our in our meaning of the word compound, we accept that use and actually we extend it. We extend it and we say if we see that there is a delta scale clinoform progressing and the shelf edge clinoform progressing at the same time, that is also a compound system. It's also a compound system. If we see that there is a, a shelf edge clinoform and the continental margin clinoform progressing at the same time, albeit at different rates, it's also a compound system. A compound system between a delta and the shelf edge, or a compound system between a shelf edge and continental margin. Sometimes you can have the full set, right? You can, you can have the, the, the delta, you, you can have the shelf edge, you can have the continental margin, all progressing at the same time. That is, you know compound of everything <laughs> and the, you know that is rare uh, to to see all of that uh, amazing uh, like this sketch but basically this sketch would would represent exactly that and then as i said before um, during the, sub the, the subsequent uh, regressive uh, part of the regressive transgressive cycles the the little mouse will move towards the shelf edge and eventually merge together and so therefore we will see less clinoforms together. You, you will tend to merge the clinoforms together, and that's what we call hybrid. So let's look at um, compound clinoforms, first of all. So uh, zooming in in this area over here, we're zooming in, in this area, these clinoforms, the delta scale clinoforms can be split into two parts in most cases. In some cases, you know, that's not obligatory. Sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't. Shoreline break, <clears throat> so therefore this is a shoreline clinoforms, and then uh, a subaqueous delta clinoforms in the mid shelf. They are both characterized by heights of tens of meters, and um, the depths of the top set for the subaqueous clinoforms it corresponds to the depths of the fair weather wave base, pretty much. And there you go, they are um, linked together between the top set area of the subaqueous and the bottom set area of the shoreline uh, clinoforms. They're joining in together and essentially they progress at the same time. One progress uh, in strictly, as I said before, in association to 
uh, river mouths, essentially, and the shoreline drifts away from the river mouths. And the, the other one progresses in association to marine currents, which are redistributing uh, in the shelf, in the inner shelf, uh, if you want to call it that. Um, a lot of the of the sediment that is being brought in by the big rivers, right? By the um, you know uh, people working in the Yangtze, yeah, Paul, uh, can uh, they look exactly at this kind of thing? All right, so we saw this profile again. Uh, so therefore, yeah. So in our talking about sequence stratigraphy terms, I think. This is uh, uh, still in the in the face of um, uh, theoretically uh, theoretical conceptions. I want to see a lot of uh, supporting data, or you know, non, not supporting data. Uh, that's possible. Uh, I think that uh, the compound situation dominates uh, after immediately after a transgression, because immediately after a transgression, what happens is you take your delta from a, from a position which is very close to the shelf edge backwards, tens of kilometers backwards sometimes. And then from that, and as a consequence, you create a separation. For the first time, you create a separation between the shelf edge and the delta. Boom, you separate them. Then your transgression ends, your sea level is st stabilizes exactly as it happened at the beginning of the Holocene uh, for, all you, for all you guys that are working in a recent system. And then from the moment when the sea level stabilizes, your deltas can begin, your mouse can start uh, running, uh, right? So, and after a while, they will reach the shelf edge again. So therefore, compound situations are most common just after a transgression. Hybrid situation when the two clinovers merge again, giving rise to a shelf edge delta or a continental margin shelf edge, you know, whatever, is most common towards the end of the regression cycle. Mm. <clears throat> and let's see some examples. <clears throat> so that's, that's uh, an example coming from uh, one of the um, you know, seminal paper, Schley et al, <clears throat> 1979, uh, Florida Hatteras and Blake Escarpment. <clears throat> and this, we're looking at big clinoforms. We are looking at very big clinoforms. We are looking at Florida Hatteras slope. That, that, that represents more or less 1.3 kilometers, this, um, vertical bar and, and this essentially is, uh, is shelf edge um, scale and that uh, um, is the Blake escarpment which represents the continental margin. So clinoforms, the red surface is the Cretaceous so it's more or less the same age and as you can see more or less from the uh, in the tertiary there was active um, uh, outbuilding over here and the uh, draping over here but you know they were growing more or less in some some way they were both growing at the same time all be with different uh, dynamic and different speed so that's what we call the shelf edge to continental scale uh, compound uh, profile <clears throat> and this you can see you know zooming in what they look like in size this is a delta to, delta to shelf edge compound profile. This is from offshore uh, Iberia, I think Portugal. Um, yeah, southern Portugal shelf. And uh, yeah, so this, that's the interpretation. This is the seismic. So you can see this is the delta scale uh, system prograding in the Holocene. That's what Hernandez Molina et al. 2000 called infralittoral prograding wedges. Essentially, it's a sand prone delta scale subregos clinoforms, according to our definition. And then this is a plastering, so very much passive, the shelf break, uh, hundreds of uh, meters height. Compound at the same time. This is from the Tiber Delta of Rome in Italy. So maximum for the surface uh, 6,000 years ago at the end of the early Holocene transgression. You have the transgression, separation between the systems as I said before, and then the little mouse starts to advance on top of that. Delta front and uh, subaqueous delta. So this is the classical situation of compound clinoforms for between delta, subaerial delta, shoreline clinoforms, and delta scale subaqueous clinoforms, which is muddy in this case. And this is the situation <clears throat> of a lot of um, muddy system, muddy subaqueous delta systems. 
So um, this is uh, being drafted, uh, um, looking at the examples from the Adriatic Sea and from uh, the Young Sea, including uh, Paul's uh, papers. And essentially what we have here, we have a main sediment source, which in the Adriatic is the Po River. In the, in the case of the East China Sea is the, is the Yangtze, for example. And then from that point, uh, a lot of sediment, fine grain sediment, in this case is being redistributed along shore by strong convective uh, marine systems, forming a very long um, uh, shoreline. Uh, hundreds uh, of, of kilometers, uh, I think, um, which can be visible in maps and can be visible with a lot of different proxies. Of course, there can be some intermediate uh, uh, sediment input point, mi minor sediment input point, for sure minor looking at the Adriatic. Uh, there are you know, all the small Apenninic rivers in Italy, they're, 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 they're little things that are contributing some additional sediment, but a lot of the sediment come from uh, the major guy over here. <clears throat> this is the interpret. This is the situation for muddy delta scale uh, climate form interpretation linked to shore parallel advective sediment transport via strong waves of current away from the main sediment input point. The sandy delta scale subaqueous climate form interpretation, like the southern Iberia, which I showed you earlier on, is similar but somehow different because it doesn't really come from a delta in most cases, but according to the interpretation of Mitchell et al, 2012, is associated to a surf zone uh, sense that is being reworked and retransported offshore during storm events. He calculated, very good paper, I very really liked, uh, it was uh, an important paper for, for, for our work. Um, he, he, he demonstrated that during storm, uh, you can entrain sand even at depths of 60 meters. That is, uh, that is you know, that is great because um, present day you find the delta scale subaqueous clinoforms that are sandy even at 60 meters. Deeper of that, you don't. 60 meters is the, is the, is the deepest you can find in terms of, uh, in terms of um, rollover points. And then you, know, you entrain sands and you transport them, them offshore with, this, with the offshore returning current. And then you, you sculpt them with shore parallel uh, marine currents. So similar to this then. So therefore, even the sandy body are oriented parallel to the, to the, to the shoreline. If you look them in plan view, very similar to the Yangtze, very similar to Adriatic, but they are much smaller. So going back to your question before, in terms of, you know, in terms of the uh, length, the plan view length of the clinoforms, uh, they are both, the, in terms of delta scale subaqueous clinoform, both the muddy ones and the sandy ones, they are parallel pretty much, they are linear and parallel to the, to the, to the shores. The, the, the muddy ones, they are associated to major, major rivers, and uh, they are much, much, much longer. There are lots and lots of kilometers. Whereas the, the sandy ones, they are smaller uh, in terms of down deep extent because they are not associated to major rivers in most cases. And this is a nice uh, uh, picture, uh, which we did looking just at the bathymetric profiles. Okay. Uh, and you can see that the, here there are different uh, profiles from all over the world uh, around the shoreline. So this is the shoreline. This is a big, and this is another. Um, and another intra-shelf uh, rollover. Now, some of these intra-shelf rollovers <clears throat> actually may not be uh, uh, subaqueous clinoforms currently active. Perhaps they were the old, old shoreline clinoforms situated in this position during the Pleistocene uh, Ice Age. <clears throat> okay, uh, but we know for sure that in a lot of these examples, that is not the case. In a lot of these examples, they are genuine a uh, genuine um, uh, compound system that are progressing uh, present day. So the first line over here, oh, oh, the, the three lines, they're all showing shown at the same vertical scale. So where is the vertical scale? Uh, yeah, here's the vertical. This is 100 meters. This is 100 meters. This is 100 meters in the three lines. But what we are changing is basically where we are compressing the horizontal scale every time. The first line, which is showing very big rivers, uh, this horizontal scale bar is 150 kilometers. This is the same length scale bar, but it represents 25 kilometers, much more compressed. Uh, we are looking essentially at mid, 
size uh, river uh, or shelves. And this is where compressing it even further, five kilometers only. So these are different scale situation, but the shoreline, uh, the, 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 the rollover depths, they are all at the same, more or less uh, at that range of depths between 10 and 60 kilometers. They are uh, so 10 to 60 meters water depths in terms of the subaqueous rollover, uh, which, which is an interesting um, observation. So <clears throat> here you go. So where do we find the uh, mat, mat prone and sun prone uh, delta scale subaqueous craniforms? So these are two nice uh, block diagrams. This one is uh, coming from uh, the Ma Mahakam Delta of Indonesia from an old paper, 1973, Gerard and Ostel. And here you can see from this old paper, they already, they already made the right observations. <laughs> there were three different clinophones, three different clinophones prograding. Sh uh, a shoreline associated to the delta. Uh, Inter mid shelf clinoform that's essentially a subaqueous delta, uh, mid, mid shelf subaqueous delta, and uh, the shelf edge over there. So that's exactly what you'd expect in you know compound system. And this is from the uh, southern Iberia case that comes from uh, the Hernandez Molina uh, et al. paper showing clearly beach clinoforms here at, at, at the shoreline. Uh, and then in the um, in the fully subaqueous settings, but still sandy, a yellow represents sand, <clears throat> subaqueous uh, clinophones. Uh, in terms of the scales, the muddy ones, uh, they are usually found on wide and gentle shelves, uh, whereas the sandy ones, they are found in narrow and steep shelves. And there is a threshold which we saw on the basis of the analysis of about 20 to 40 kilometers in width of the shelves. So shelves that are wider from the shoreline to the shelf break, wider than 20 to 40 kilometers, they tend to host the muddy system. Uh, shelves that are narrower than 20 to 40 kilometers, so very narrow shelves, obviously, they, they tend to host the uh, sandy system. And also the gradient of the shelves, uh, the, the, the threshold tends to be between 0 0.25 and 0 0.40 degrees uh, of shelf gradient. If you are steeper than that, you tend more often to have the sandy. If you're less steep than that, you tend more often to have uh, the muddy. As a consequence, the muddy system is more common of tectonic quiescent context. The sandy system is more common in tectonically active uh, settings. And you can see this is a, a summary between um, the muddy and the sandy system. Uh, drawn at the same scale. This is five kilometers, this is 25 meters. Big shelves for the sandy ones, uh, nice low gradient clinoforms, subaqueous clinoforms for the muddy ones. Whereas the sandy ones, they are very, very close, uh, much closer to, to the shoreline in terms of down deep extent, and uh, they are much steeper. Okay, and you can see all these differences that are listed there. Shelf, wide and gentle uh, for the muddy, narrow and steep for the sandy. Clinoforms, wide and gentle for the muddy, narrow and steep for the, uh, for the sandy. Subaqueous rollover, shallower um, and far from shoreline. In this case, the subaqueous rollover can be situated tens of kilometers away from the shoreline in the case of the Young Sea or the Amazon. Uh, in this other one, they're much, much closer to the shoreline, you know, uh, my, uh, but they can be actually deeper. They can be deeper because here uh, there is greater energy in order to transport sand. So yeah, statistically tends to have a deeper fair weather wave base. The, 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 the geometry, they are both sigmoidal, tending to be sigmoidal. They can be a little bit oblique, but tending to be uh, sigmoidal. Uh, whereas Siberia clinophones tend to be uh, more oblique. Um, yeah, there is a large riverborne sediment supply for this one and little riverborne sediment supply for this. Progradation for this is very fast because it comes with a huge sediment load from the river mouth. And uh, this one is, uh, you know, not very slow, it, uh, slow uh, progradation because it comes, is associated to occasional events of feeding sand uh, associated with storm, according to the Mitchell model. 
um, uh, strong uh, waves, current, and tides. And this is a weaker waves, current, and tides. Tectonic, active, tectonic, quiescent. So that's, that's the generic. Um, and now let's see. Let's see some example just uh, just to to um, relax a little bit. So we have recent example that I'm going to show you quickly. One again is the one from southern Iberia uh, in terms of uh, some prone subacus, then uh, mud subacus, uh, Adriatic, and Ganges, uh, and then old exam ancient example. This only if you're for nation Jurassic of Norway. So. Holocene Ganges Delta. You go so situated. This is the Ganges River mouth present day. That's where the subaqueous uh, rollover is situated presently. So that is, uh, I don't know, several tens of kilometers away from the river uh, mouth. And it is, um, it has been, it has been uh, progressing uh, since the last, uh, um, the attainment of the last uh, um, high stand, Holocene high stand. So six, seven thousand years ago to the present day. That has been clearly proven by a lot of papers that are collecting cores and doing lots of nice uh, analysis. That's where this uh, sigmoidal profile is taken from, from this location. And this is what the um, seismic looks like in that position. This is from the Adriatic. So as I said before, there is the river mouth, the Po River here, and from there, Currents are redistributing and forming a long strike, very long, a long strike um, mud belt, they also call it. Uh, position A, that's the subaerial delta of the Po. Position B, Gargano, long distance away from the Po. And we have um, Sabacus delta, mud the Sabacus delta, which is uh, um, being um, prograding and aggrading as well. Uh, since uh, the last, uh, you know, since uh, six, seven thousand years ago. This has been proven by carbon 14 cores and lots of other analysis that have been uh, excellent uh, works that have been uh, doing there. You can see how they look like in seismic. Very interestingly, very interesting, they even correlated a phase of enhanced subaerial progression in the pore. Delta during the uh, starting 500 years ago, so correlated to the Little Ice Age. Uh, so there was a phase of enhanced progradation of the uh, Siberian Po, but also at the same time, enhanced progradation of the Gargano, hundreds of kilometers away from it. So almost a direct correlation, hard link between the two uh, locations, even though they're so far away from each other. And then uh, the Sandy. The sandy uh, sub uh, delta scale uh, subaqueous clinoform. Mm, again, our example from uh, southern Iberia. Um, you know, you could say, well, perhaps this is the, um, you know, this is the uh, Pleistocene shoreline uh, during the Ice Age and it's been drowned. And uh, that's what we look at. However, they've done analysis um, in terms of uh, uh, seismic stratigraphy and also isotopic analysis, proving that this is a body, a sand body that is actively growing uh, presently. Uh, and it has been deposited um, since, again, since uh, starting from uh, 6.5 thousand years ago. Again, the same age worldwide, the beginning of uh, um, progression of all these bodies is the same age everywhere. Seven to six thousand years ago, at the end of the early Holocene transgression, our last major transgression events uh, after the Ice Age. And this is what it looks like in seismic. <clears throat> ancient examples. So, all the ancient examples they show uh, that can be somehow relatable to subaqueous craniforms, delta scale craniform heights. That is necessary. You need to have tens of meters height. Well developed top set. The top set needs to be well developed. Why? Because if you lack the top set, uh, you can be um, looking at the top truncated shoreline clinoform, right? So you need you need to make sure that the top set is present and it is marine. If the top is present, it is marine. You cannot interpret that as, as a shoreline uh, clinoform. And 
In plan view, so if you have 3D seismic, you can map it in plan view. It must be a short parallel and more or less linear plan view uh, geometry. You can see here some examples uh, from different uh, areas, uh, the UK Jurassic, uh, here it's uh, Utah uh, based on outcrops. And this is actually interestingly from carbonate system as well. Carbonate system as well can show uh, delta scale subaqueous system because this part of area is shallow marine sun grade sediments. It will be all ice, for example. And you know, it's got a well-developed top set, but um, it's not associated to um, subaerial sediment, the top set, or any indication of, of, of shoreline um, uh, position, essentially. Uh, whereas in this other case, we actually do see a presence of uh, reef, for example, which indicates uh, the presence of zero meter water in that uh, place. So if your formation, which was part of my uh, PhD, you can see again, clinoforms, which are well-developed top set, uh, which are <clears throat> don't have uh, indications of um, sub fascias. They are short detached off-flap breaks, um, more or less, uh, consistent internal architecture, which is more alike to that of a subaerial delta, exclu exclusive occurrence of marine fascias. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's a series of evidence that, um, again, still tentative, but uh, yeah, that, 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 that can uh, be more relatable, for example, to the uh, Spanish um, shore detached uh, sand bodies. And this is what we published as an idea of, of uh, evolution of, uh, of the Sonia Fjord uh, formation. So starting from uh, the eastern part, with the, which is shown basically um, shelf type of sediments. And then they become coarser grained moving, the, moving offshore, which, which is uh, associated perhaps to an increase of um, speed uh, of energy of the waves, for example, and the currents over there. And you can ask yourself, where is the shoreline? Uh, interestingly, the, the Sonia Fjord formation is situated here where the troll field is. In, um, <clears throat> this is the, in, in Norway. Th th that is the present day shoreline of Norway. This is the city of Bergen. There is a paper that was pub published uh, in 97 that reported um, the presence of uh, Oxford, Oxfordian age shoreline sandy deposits at the city of Bergen. Uh, in the tunnel that they, 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 they drilled there. And this is Oxfordian age, the song of information. So how can you have a shoreline at the city of Bergen at the same time you, you cannot have at the same time Oxfordian, <coughs> um, the, the shoreline uh, situated uh, in two places that are hundreds of kilometers apart, you know? So that's um, another, another uh, interesting evidence. Also in this location over here, there is, uh, which is to the to the east, you know, going towards the shoreline. Uh, there is still presence of shelf fall system and sandstone. So it's not only in the troll field, but also uh, closer to the um, to the to the coastlines. And this is my, I think, the, is my last uh, slide, which is uh, showing again this idea that I've been telling you several times uh, during the course of of this talk today about the mice and the elephants, right? So the, that's how we grow the systems uh, through repeated, regressive, transgressive, cross-shelf transits of shoreline clinoforms uh, or delta scale clinoforms, uh, which are the mice. They, they are the ones that they, they can progress fast and they can backstep fast. So we start to uh, build clinoforms. After a while, they become shelf edge scale clinoforms. Uh, then there is a transgression and you detach the shoreline from the shelf edge, the shoreline moves backward, back steps, and the shelf edge is present here, starts to form <clears throat> a plastering passive uh, clinoforms at this, at this time, while all the, all the active uh, deposition happens at the shoreline, tens of meters over here. But at the same time, it's able to cross the shelf very, very, very fast during the subsequent uh, regressive uh, cycle. And after that, a while, it will reach again. Um, the shelf edge location forming a hybrid system. So that's the compound system, delta to shelf edge. This is a hybrid system where delta and shelf edge are together. They're joined together, they are married together again. And <clears throat> this is, there are lots of publications 
from the group of um, Ron, uh, Ron Steele, for example, which talks about uh, the fact that uh, in shelf edge clinoforms, which uh, are clinoforms that are, in particular, when you look at the old systems, 90% of the clinoforms uh, that are visible in your seismic for the old system is of this kind of scale. It's hundreds of meter scale. So they are talking about that kind of clinoform. Um, and in the clinoforms, is it, is it sandy? Is it muddy? Should we drill it? Shouldn't we drill it? And essentially, uh, the answer is, uh, if your delta, if your little mouse has reached that position, it may be sandy during that time, but then it will backstep. And when it backsteps, it becomes uh, a passive uh, mud declinophones on top of it, which is passive clustering it. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a two system component, two component system, um, sandy active and muddy passive. And it is dictated by the cycles of uh, backstepping and, uh, and fast uh, progradation, backstepping and fast progradation of the uh, delta scale <coughs> climaforms. On one scale up, similar relationship can be between the shelf edge climaforms and the continental margin climaforms as well, because the, uh, the shelf edge climaforms will be faster than the continental margin climaform. Application of this concept, uh, again, going back, you remember, this is the system from the Aridanos. And this is, uh, this is the, 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 the um, uh, evolution. So in Tragelasian, we can see here the Aridanos prograding, coming from Fenoscandia. Early Calabria, you can see the um, delta scale, um, delta scale, uh, um, Delta scale clinoforms here and the shelf clinoforms there separated. So this is a compound system, compound system between delta and shelf edge. Towards the end of this stage, there is a relative sea level fall. This relative sea level fall uh, in the early Calabrian causes the two uh, clinoforms to merge together, giving rise to um, a shelf edge, uh, um, a shelf edge delta which really uh, becomes also faster towards the end of, of its progression, also because it was running out of uh, accommodation space. And uh, at the end of this, there was a new sea level rise and contourites um, the position in association to that. <clears throat> okay, so my second conclusions and the end of uh, my chat here is that all kind of systems, uh, they derive from this dynamic uh, interplay between cyclical backstepping of the smaller scale uh, systems and then the subsequent uh, cross shelf transit of the small scale delta scale clinoforms. And uh, yeah, after it, uh, shortly after the transgression, you should be able to see separate clinoform system, a delta, which is separate from the shelf edge, which is separate from the continental margin. And then during the subsequent regressive cycle, the, the various clinoforms will merge into each other forming hybrid clinoforms such as the shelf edge delta. As a consequence, this very much uh, distributes uh, your uh, sediments in different settings within your shelf and in, in your basin. And um, yeah, so that's, uh, that's, that's the end of my, um, of my uh, talk. Thank you very much. Wow, uh, Stefano, that's so great. Um, I mean, even a little bit uh, over time, but this is what we need. It's uh, so rich, and <laughs> this is a fantastic. Um, Thank you. Um, okay, uh, let's see. Uh, you, you have any questions in the audience, and you can go ahead, unmute yourself, directly ask us if no, and take uh, this opportunity. Okay, I have a question from uh, Jero. Jero, yeah. Geronimo Zuazo from Argentina. So well, he was asking about uh, what do you think of the possibility of using the shoreline auto retreat as an argument to predict the presence or not of Sobekus delta scale clinoforms? It would be possible to use progradation rate and vertical accumulation rate to do so. Mm -hmm. And also, there, there is a possible contradiction of shoreline auto retreat in the sense of, in the sense of Muto and Steel. With the conception of shoreline auto retreat of, of uh, Helen Dunson and Hampson. Um, I'm not too sure about the last point, uh, but I definitely use the shoreline auto retreat concept in, um, 
uh, in building up this uh, theoretical framework, which I talked about. And uh, essentially, um, yeah, so uh, the, the concept of Scholar and Autoretreat tells you that the backstepping is not only dictated by uh, sea level or relative sea level, but it, it may also be dictated essentially that uh, you're running out of uh, sediment input. Your, 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 your accommodation is too, um, is too large and as a consequence, you can, you, can only, you can only start to go backwards. And yeah, that is, that is a complication on, on top of the sequence stratigraphic, the simple, the simple sequence stratigraphic models. And we've seen through the years that there are a number of complications that have been built on top of the sequence stratigraphic model. But still, you know, we, we, we want to try to um, give a, a simple framework to begin with. And then there will always be that case that people can point out and say, ah, but, ah here, here is not, it's not exactly working because, and, and, and uh, that's fine. Cool. Stefano, uh, could, you, could you back to the last slide before you're concluding? Okay. Uh, go up, up. Uh, why don't, I don't see anything. Just the, the, the mouse, uh, you stop sharing. Okay. Can you see now? Uh, it's coming. Um, that's uh, the 45. Let's see 45, the last one, the up one. Yeah. Uh, can you see? Go, go, go up uh, 45. For 45. Yeah. You, you know, my question is uh, if you look at the Holocene, the Holocene sea level high stand already six or 7,000 years. But uh, most of that cloniform, the delta cloniform, it's kind of still uh, detached from the shelf uh, edge cloniform. Yeah, they are, so, they are mid, mid shelf, right? They are somewhere here. Yeah, there's a gap, yeah. the middle shelf. And yeah, even yeah. at the shelf edge, that looks like it's a sea level low stand regressional deposits. And only the near shore inner shelf is represent the high stand uh, last uh, Holocene cloniform. Uh -huh. You see that that you know the separation. Yeah, yeah, that, 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 but that, that that is fine because um, uh, still still you you have the uh, the begin of uh, progradation of the delta scale ones. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the transgression, so at the end of uh, about six seven thousand years ago, right, uh, yeah. Paul? That's when they begin, and yeah. that's where uh, when uh, the sea level attained more or less uh, still stand. You know, yeah. the, the, the the more or less the present day situation and then from that point onwards you know the mouse start uh, running and uh, at the moment it's uh, somewhere in the middle of the shelf now yeah, whether, yeah. Wh whether it will uh, manage to reach the, the shelf edge or not uh, it depends on a number of factors it depends on how much yeah. sediment input there is uh, yeah. exactly uh, again the concept of auto retreat that we just uh, touched on uh, with the previous question if there is if there isn't enough sediment input at, at a certain point, it will start to backstep, um, yeah. and the accommodation uh, available. Uh, the fact that there are uh, the sea level continues no, not to change. Uh, if the sea level no, um, goes down, for example, if there was the beginning of a, of a new ice age, uh, you know that, that would be a, a great help uh, to to the to the um, uh, for for the delta scale uh, kind of ones to merge with with the with the shoreline ones. Yeah. And yeah, so the fact that we, we, we see basically um, uh, that downward pointing uh, trajectories in the, um, in the shelf, uh, in the, for the shelf edge, well, uh, perhaps that is uh, in association to the Pleistocene cycle. Uh, is, is it for that, uh, Paul? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, Michael, you have a question? Uh, one question I was just going to add to what... Um, what you were saying, yeah, I, uh, I forgot. But yeah, I definitely see the, the two, um, that, that progression, that separation of the, you know, uh, delta scale cliniform from the, from the shoreline cliniform. And, you know, whether or not it reaches the shelf edge or not, you know, depends on the sea level cycle. You know, the last time it did because the sea level was so, was so large. Um, in, most, in most places, but 
you know, through most of the non-glacial times, it, it often didn't reach the, uh, the, the shore, or the, some of the shoreline never reached the shelf edge. Um, I also find that, that a model that during the uh, beginning of the transgression, often the shoreline is transgressing and that erosion from the transgression actually means that the delta client form continues prograding uh, longer and they get out of phase for a, a little while mm. or it mm. starts retreating. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, no, I, I definitely, I definitely agree. Of course, uh, uh, if uh, the sea level lowers, that is great. As I said, is a great help for uh, the shoreline to reach the, the shelf edge. However, uh, I mean, it has been uh, discussed on papers. I think from the from the steel group uh, that, that 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 is uh, possible during the normal regression if you have sufficient uh, sediment input. So the sediment input is the the additional variable. Uh, on top of the cycles of, of the sea level, right? So if you are in a place where, you know, with a lot of sediment, it will, you will fill the shelf regardless of the sea level. Yeah. And, um, and one question, when you look at the, the shoreline trajectories, um, you know, one thing is things like the um, compaction, sediment loading, um, thermal substance will affect those trajectories. So the trajectory is not just directly a reflection of sea level anymore. You know, you yeah. can you can get it uh, a climate form. You know, climbing even during a sea level a, a small sea level fall. Um, you mm. know, just because the subsidence being induced is, is greater than the, the sea level rise, the sea level fall. Yeah, no, indeed, indeed. Uh, I think I I, I tried to touch on that um, while while I was showing the data. The fact that the big scale clinoforms are uh, um, uh, responding to subsidence and thermal subsidence uh, much more than the small ones. The small ones, they are essentially short term cycles dictated by the inputs, sediment input fields. And uh, yeah, th there is definitely the additional element to consider of post depositional deformation. Uh, of the clinoforms. And uh, there are a number of papers, including one that I participated to, uh, in order to try to um, uh, go back to the original depositional morphology. Uh, I think that, oh, you know, yeah, there are, these papers are showing that in certain cases, you see downward pointing trajectories, but in reality, that's because the, uh, you know, the, the, it has been rotated. Um, but in that case, you, you'd still be able to see some uh, some elements to point to point out to that. For example, uh, the top set, well well formed top set that has not been uh, that, that is not been um, eroded, you know, basically uh, resembling uh, a good cycle of aggradation, right? So if you have uh, an aggrading top set but rotated, uh, that 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 could be quite uh, uh, easy to 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 understand. Um, but yeah, it is definitely another complicating factors that we should uh, ha have in mind when we when we look at clinoform. Okay, cool. Anybody else? Uh, uh, Brian, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, thanks for sharing all that work. I, I I remember when that paper came out, and I've assigned it for my students ever since. Um, oh, thanks. I want to go back to the width question because I. I I want to get your insight on this because I'm wondering, and the reason I ask is we're doing some work where we want to estimate the volume of a clinothem. We have the dip direction, right? Which is what we focus on, right? All your measurements, um, but we'd like to estimate the width. And, and I guess I'm wondering if we can even say there's a characteristic width because of all the along strike mm complexity, right? If there's multiple point sources or currents, like that Adriatic example, exactly. So I'm just, you know, uh, I know, I, is that why it's so difficult to, to try to map and constrain widths because we can't kind of wrap our arms around what width even means for these systems. And I'm sure this is something you thought about as you, you know, did this research. Yeah. So I just wanted to probe that a little bit more. I think, uh, so basically you mean the along strike extent by width? Yeah, basically if the challenge is to yeah. come up with a volume of a clinothem, you need yeah. width, right? Um, length, you know, proximal yeah. distal length is not that difficult to get if you have, you know, decent data, right? 
yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, well, so the along the along strike extends. Uh, the, uh, in, in, if you read my the, the paper, the my, the Patrone Landansen, we we wrote something in terms of um, the the the, the sandy one are I think on top of my head, uh, tens of kilometers. Um, uh, elongated. They form bodies that are ten tens of kilometers uh, uh, wide along strike, whereas the muddy ones, they can be hundreds of kilometers. This example, for example, is hundreds of kilometers. Uh, so my, my, my feeling, it's still a feeling because it's not based on enough uh, statistical uh, data point. Uh, of course, if you have 3D data, but it must be, you know, big, big 3D data sometimes to cover the, the whole system. Uh, you can reconstruct it easily. But my feeling, as I said, is if you are dealing with the muddy system, uh, it can basically fill the whole basin. And we, we can see that in the Adriatic, uh, in the Yangtze, in the Amazon, they're, they're basically a long strike, filling the whole basin, a long strike. Uh, whereas if, if you are dealing with the, uh, with the sandy one, they are small, they're small guys. They're small guys. There are tens of kilometers along strike. Mm. Yeah, and it makes me wonder if there's some, and I don't do experiments, but you know, if you assume a single point source, um, is there sort of a, a characteristic aspect ratio, right? If a, if a Klein FM is, you know, X long, proximal distal, it's 2X wide or 3X wide or something like that. But I think, all, you know, the multiple point sources and currents really complicate that because it can, you know, move everything around, so. Mm -hmm. Can I ask you a little bit? Uh, you know, uh, Brian is definitely, um, what we observed, for example, the arms on, the Vs, I mean, the band, I mean, the long show band, the Vs is all the way to 60 meters, six zero water depths. And mm. this is very similar to the Yangtze and uh, the Yellow River, and even including the Pearl River. The, there's a reason. I think, Brian, you can spend a little bit time to figure out because the reason is if the shoreline is fixed, if there's a rocky shoreline, then the point source come out, then have a long shore drift. So there's a limitation during the Holocene high stand, how much the material can have that kind of long shore drift and also cross shelf advection, diffusion. So this is kind of a limitation provide most of, most of the case only propagate across the shelf to 60, 70 meters, then stop there. Because this is the under sea level is almost the high stand stabilized. The long shore drift diffusion have a, you know, cross shelf portion. So- yeah, a, a long strike, it can, it can uh, cover the whole basin. Yeah, the long shore easy because yeah. the long shore drifting, that's easy you can, yeah. you can figure out. But the cross shelf portion, that's the key. But there's other exceptional, for example, the Mekong River. The Mekong River, we found that the band V is only to 20 meters. In the beginning, we are very puzzled. Why look at the other system, all the way to the Holocene sea level stand, is they, they able to, to reach to 60 meters, but the Mekong only 20 meters. The reason is because the Mekong Delta is a proper dating overall that the whole delta is pushing forward. Mm, so the mm. overall decliniform was buried. The, the modern shoreline only represents the last 1,000 years. But the Amazon, Yangtze, that the compound represents the last whole six or 7,000 years. I mean, that's a very interesting. Maybe three of us, you know, maybe we can, you know, we can have a little bit of review people about this. That's very interesting. But essentially, uh, to my mind, uh, if you have a simplified system, uh, as Brian was suggesting, where we have one big sediment input point, yeah. and then basically the other constraints that you have is it, the uh, fair weather wave base, yeah. uh, essentially. Uh, so 20 meters, 30 meters, that, that's your top set uh, depth. And then the morphology of the substrate, right? The morphology of su substrate. Mm -hmm. and, and then to, you start to build your triangles in cross-section. They are triangles, right? And then these triangles, they progress further outwards. Mm -hmm. uh, a long strike, they can be infinite <laughs> in, in theory, right? A, yes, that's true. A, a long strike can be infinite, but 
uh, across shelf, they are not infinite, as, as you are just uh, saying now. And actually, what you just said, it, it is uh, something that is consistent with my result, because uh, another parameter that I uh, used, which I didn't talk uh, about today, is the um, uh, re resistance to progradation, I called. And essentially what it is, is just the progradation rate divided the aggradation rate. Mm -hmm. So when the progradation is much faster than aggradation, that means, you know, this guy is very, very fast. When the progradation is much less than the aggradation rate, it means it's building up uh, and it I cannot, uh, it can, it cannot uh, reach out very much. And, and it looks like in all of the kind of ones, but as in, in the subaqueous deltas as well, all carnivores begins with very fast progradation compared to a gradation. And then uh, slowly, slowly, this ratio reverses. And it will reach a point where perhaps, you know, the, 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 the auto-retreat may begin, um, mm. as we said before. Cool, cool. Very, very nice. This is also related to the raw over depths because people realize that, you know, the raw over depths, there's a little bit of variation, the different. But something is very strong related to what he talked about. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, if no, I say, if you know any other question, we have to stop here. And uh, I also had to go, I also have to conduct a COVID, COVID test because <laughs> I have, I am now I have a field course teaching uh, three weekend. So every time before, <laughs> before the class uh, starts, I have, I have to do a that's test. Fun. Nice 11 o'clock, I, I had to go to have a test. Okay, Stanford, thank you so much. This is a wonderful. I think just like your paper, there's so much information. I think uh, uh, definitely your talk, I will assign to students to watch again and again. Okay, thank <laughs> and you And also very read much your paper. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. Bye, everyone. And, okay, bye-bye. Uh, it was a pleasure to, to meet you all, uh, you know, uh, online. <laughs>